Good day. Good day. It's so good to, to be here with you again as we continue uh, today in our study of Psalm 119. I pray all is well with you and that uh, you are trusting in the Lord. So I have a question to begin with. Let's uh, get right into it, if you will. What is important to you? What is important to you? Is it your family, your job, your money, your retirement, your upcoming vacation? What is important to you? Well, let's go back a little bit uh, to February 2014. And there, the Gospel Coalition.org posted an article called Selfies, Self-Deception, and Self-Worship. And the article revealed an interesting fact. Did you know that in 2013, the word selfie made it into the official Oxford Dictionary? Apparently, selfie was the word of the year in 2013. Man, who knew that? I did Yet the article goes on and proposes that the official year of the selfie reveals something important about the culture itself. And it presents two important conclusions, what it calls two important conclusions. One, quote, we value ourselves, and two, we value what other people think about the way we look, especially in front of our bathroom mirrors. And the proof, I think, is in the pudding, as they say. Because indeed, the culture values, as we look around, what, others people, what other people think highly. And so how do we know this? Well, many of us are more than willing to fill our Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and other social media platforms with our selfies, photos, and videos. The article goes on to state tongue-in-cheek, quote, after all, in the Instagram world, the first day of the week is not the Lord's Day, but Selfie Sunday. Well, you might be saying to yourself, Pastor, we all do it. What's wrong with sharing our photos and videos on our fa uh, with our family and friends on Instagram, Facebook, etc.? What's the problem, Pastor? Well, maybe, friends, just maybe the problem isn't the photos and the videos we share. Maybe the problem is with our attitudes and our hearts. And when we think of the social media platforms that we, met, that we go on, let's not kid ourselves. The social media platforms are designed specifically and purposely in their very coding to appeal to our very desires. In other words, what we like. The leaders, the social media leaders, present the culture with a technology that they advertise as, quote, to connect people together. But consider with me the thesis that the article suggests. Quote, an app that promotes the idea that self is supreme, intended or not, reveals a problematic characteristic with the culture at large. And then it goes on to explain it this way. We've seen our own reflection and we've fallen in love with it. We're enthralled with our own faces, our own beauty, and we've been deceived. The tech reveals that what matters to most of us is quite obviously us. Well, with this in mind, let's turn to our text for the day, Psalm 119, verse 33 to 40. Verse 33 to 40, Psalm 119. Verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread from your rules, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. The Lord bless the reading his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you as we now turn to this wonderful psalm as we continue our time and our study here. We ask for, O oh Lord, uh, your illumination into this text and then that it would move and change in our hearts and move us in, our, in the direction towards you. And we thank you for that, Lord, and we pray that you be glorified in all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we begin to open up 
this, these verses, uh, let me rephrase the question that we began with. You know that question, what is important to you? Let me put it this way. What do you value the most? You know, as we live out our days, as you think about that, day in and day out, whether we recognize it or not, we automatically keep a tally of our day. In other words, all of our experiences, all our interactions, our emotions, everything, we keep a record of. And when we do that, we also attach, whether we recognize it or not, to each experience a value factor. This was important, that not so much. Um, this mattered highly to me, that over there, not so much. And now, if the thesis of our article is valid, quote, the tech reveals that what matters to most of us is quite obviously us, then as someone else said, quote, when we look at the things that are exalted among men or, or valued in our culture and in our own lives as measures of worth, we are exalting what God doesn't exalt. Now, I put some words into this quote, and, uh, and I didn't mean to do that, but it's the point is, what do you value the most? You know, in my preparation this past week, I, I drafted an email to someone and said concerning uh, the text before us today in uh, that preparatory time, one thing I noticed is that the psalmist is praying that God would illuminate the word of God, for without a doubt, he delights in following God. And as I was thinking about that, I said this, interesting how we can get to a place where delighting in the ways of God takes second place. Isn't that true? Often, God takes the back seat in our lives. God plays second fiddle in our lives. Well, the psalmist in our text prays to God and asks him to teach him, to give him, to lead him, to incline his heart, to turn his eyes. And we see through these eight verses, verse after verse, verb by verb, the psalmist prayed that God would be God in his life. As someone once said of the psalmist here in this context, quote, he was in it for the long haul, there was no off-ramp. Verse 33, the psalmist said, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Please notice with me the phrase, the way, the way. This phrase is used by the psalmist in Psalm 119 13 times. And the Hebrew is translated by the ESV, which I'm using, the way, or maybe some of you are using the NIV to follow. And it means road, way, journey, manner. It's also used as a metaphor, and that is how this Hebrew verb is being applied in our text today. When we began our study, we said some things about uh, Psalm 119. And one thing we said, we said that the Word of God mirrors the nature and character of God. Therefore, my friends, the psalmist prayed that God would teach him the ways of God. How would he do this? By the means of the word of God. That the psalmist's course of life, his journey in life, the road on which his life would take him, would be in the ways of God. It would be marked by the ways of God. For the psalmist, even here in his own words, identified himself as a servant of God at verse 38. You see, indeed, the psalmist was in it for the long haul. King David once prayed in like manner when he said, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Psalm 86, 6, verse 11. As we were considering social media, well, it certainly has become a major force in the culture, and that, frankly, is an understatement. Of course, it's not the place or the platform to go in depth on, on the subject. However, we should not ignore the issue as it has and will continue to impact our culture moving forward in every sphere, including you and me. The question the text before, before us asks of you and me as followers of Christ is this. What value factor do we place on the Word of God? You know, just as I can know what you value or what is important to you by where you spend your money, I can also know what you value or what is important to you, how you use social media. 
And the same can be applied to myself. So the question remains, is the course of your life, my life, as a believer, the journey that you and I are on as followers of Jesus, the manner in which we live out our lives, day in and day out, God's way or our way? Well, returning to the text, we find that a psalmist not only committed to keep the word of God, to keep the way God, he prayed, give me understanding. Verse 34. You see that there, I hope. The question is, understanding of what? Well, the answer is simple. The word of God. Because that's what he's praying about. This implied the psalmist could not understand without the help of God. In other words, the psalmist here appealed to the author of the word of God directly. So I want to ask you, have you ever asked God to give you understanding of a particular text you're studying? You know, I find it interesting and somewhat puzzling how some preface their comments about a particular text that they're reading or studying or a study of a book in the Bible by saying, this means to me. This means to me. Maybe before we say anything, we might adopt the prayer the psalmist prayed to God. God, give me understanding. Let's turn to James in his letter in the New Testament for some helpful commentary. James in that letter was writing primarily in the, uh, to Jewish Christians who were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire for a variety of reasons and were facing a variety of trials for their faith in Jesus. So, J so James writes to encourage them to stay the course and to ask God as their faith was being tested, if any of you lacks wisdom, let them ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. And you'll find that in James verse, chapter 1, verse 5. My friends, whether we seek to understand the word of God or face the circumstances of our daily lives, as followers of Jesus Christ, we seek the wisdom and the illumination of the Spirit of God. How do we do that? We pray. And then we pray. And then we pray some more. You see, the psalmist prayed that God would teach him, would give him understanding so that he would keep the word of God and observe it with his whole heart. Verse 34, that he would observe it with all his strength, with all his mind, with all of who he was. That the course of his life would be according to the way of God, that God would lead him, or as the NIV translates it, direct him in the path of God's commandments. Verse 35. And it's here in verse 35, which is interesting, we find another Hebrew verb translated in the path. And this verb is similar to the verb that was translated the way in verse 33. So what we have here is another metaphor for the course of life. And the psalmist, as one commentator put it so well, quote, the lights in following the Lord's path. The psalmist the light is directed by God's word rather than following the way that seems right to him. So friends, we, we can summarize verse 33 to 35 with two words. The way, the way of God, if you will. And let us pray that God will teach us and give us understanding and wisdom and lead us in his way every day. Well, friends, if verse 33 to 35 can be summarized with two words, the way, verse 36 and 37, as we move on, can be summarized with two words as well, the truth, the truth. John's Gospel, chapter 18, records the events of Jesus' trial before the Roman governor, Pilate. And Jesus said to Pilate, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. That's in John chapter 18, verse 37. Now we could say a lot about this verse, but simply say it this way, that Jesus had come to proclaim uh, that the kingdom of God was near and to repent for the kingdom of God that was near. That was the truth. Pilate responded and asked Jesus, what is truth? Now, isn't that the phrase of our time? What is truth? 
Our postmodern culture has for a long time now decided the truth cannot be known. The culture today would recommend to the psalmist in our text that he is wasting his time seeking truth for it cannot be known. And as for seeking God, well, that's not a good choice at all either. But let's go back and think about the trial of Jesus. And you can read about that trial in John's Gospel, in the Gospels, all of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And you will see that it was a sham. The charges against Jesus were propped up with one lie after another. The question is, what was the driving force behind the trial? That was a sham. Hatred for the truth. And the engine that powered this hatred for the truth was selfishness and greed and power. Those things that really motivate our culture in so many ways and many of us as well. Do you know what drives the culture today? Well, that article described it so well in its title. Selfies, self-deception, and self-worship. And all this is propped up on the back of one lie after another lie. And it's selfishness and greed that powers that engine of lies. I think if the psalmist were here with us, he would say once more, No, not for me. Today, God, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Verse 36. No, not for me. Today, God, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Verse 37. The psalmist, even in his own struggles and afflictions, afflictions, remained a truth seeker. And where was that truth to be found? Short answer, the Word of God, the Bible. Let's go back even further in time before the psalmist and consider with me that great general of Israel, Joshua. Joshua, God had appointed Joshua as the nation's leader after they had crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land after 40 years of uh, exile in the desert. And towards the end of his life, he had gathered all the tribes of Israel, all the officials, the priests, at Sheshem, it says in in that text. And he reminded the Israelites all that God had done for them. And he went right back to Abraham, all the way up to Moses and the exodus from slavery in Egypt through the 40 years of desert wandering and into the promised land under his leadership. And Joshua put a challenge before the Israelites. He said, choose whom you will serve. And he said to the people, put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. For me and my house we will serve the Lord. Back to our text, the psalmist prayed that his whole life, every bit of it, would be directed by what God values and directs. The truth that is found in the Word of God. Well, my friends, we can see here in these three verses what you and I struggle with every day. Every day. What the psalmist psalmist struggled with You see, my friends, our human nature desires autonomy from God. We don't want God in our human nature, in our human selfish desires. You know, it's with with a blink of an eye that we are disposed to place our desires on what gives us instant gratification. The instant gratification and dopamine hit of likes and hearts of our selfish desires. Or as the psalmist aptly puts here in verse 37, worthless things. So in other words, our inclination is to move toward falsehood. And the psalmist understood this and prayed that God would turn his eyes from falsehood to the truth of God's word. So we called verse 33 to 35 the way and verse 36 to 37 the truth. Let's call verse 38 to 40 the life. Do you notice what I have done there? The way, the truth, and the life. Who said that? Well, moving on, as you think about that, we began by exploring the way of God that we discover in the Word of God. 
Indeed, the nature and characteristic of God we discover in his word, and it will lead us in the way of God. And key to this, we said, was prayer. We pray and we pray and we pray some more. Next, the way of God or the ways of God can be summarized as the truth. Truth which our culture refuses to recognize because truth no longer can be known. Or, to put it another way, truth is relative. And the truth we discovered is this. Left to our own devices, we would choose falsehood over the truth of God. Our inclination is to seek the likes and the hearts of our desires rather than recognize our own falsehood, selfishness, and greed. Again, key to understanding the Word of God is where we will find the truth about ourselves and what God's will for us is. We need to pray that God will illuminate the Word of God to us. Well, in these last verses, the psalmist, a servant of God, prayed that God would fulfill his promise to him. The psalmist asked him to fulfill his promise to him. And what was that promise? Let's unpack this somewhat. The psalmist makes his appeal here based on who God is. We have already understood that there's falsehood in our nature and in our culture, but what is God like? What is God like? Well, Moses said this about God. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? You'll find that in Numbers 23, verse 19. What is God like? Well, according to Moses, God cannot lie. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament put it this way. It is impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6, 18. So friends, God cannot lie when he makes a promise. He is faithful to keep all of his promises that we find in the word of God. We also have learned in this text that the psalmist had his own struggles. And it appears there's a sense here in the text that some of his struggles came from the people around him. For he said, turn away the reproach that I dread. Verse 39. The psalmist was experiencing some sort of criticism or even persecution from the surrounding culture for his faith in God. Yet it is clear that his confidence was in God who would do for the psalmist what was just and good and right. So with all this in mind, we come back to that one final question to ask in this particular set of texts. What promise was the psalmist praying that God would keep? Well, friends, the answer is in verse 40, where the psalmist said, Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. In your righteousness, give me life. The psalmist prayed that God would fulfill his word or promise of righteousness, that God would be gracious toward him and promote the awe, the fear of God, the reverence of God in him. The psalmist put his trust and faith in the righteousness of God of God, not in his own righteousness. My friends, it is the righteousness of God that would give the psalmist life, that would revive him. Well, this brings us back to where we started. And that question, that pesky question, what do you value the most? Take your time with that question. Chew on it for a while. We see that the psalmist was in for the long haul, despite the struggles, afflictions and even pressures in his own cultural context. His desire was to follow the way of God, to understand the word of God. The psalmist wanted his life even to be examined by the truth of God's word, not by the whims or fancies of his context or his own selfishness and greed. The psalmist prayed for the righteousness of God to be revealed in and through his life. We also know the psalmist, what the psalmist valued. What do you value? Let me ask you another question. As you think about that question, what do you value? What do you want now? The good news or the bad news first? And this is not a joke. You see, we need to understand both. We need to understand the bad news and we need to understand the good news. And the Bible talks about it in this terms. 
The bad news, spiritually speaking, is that we were all born sinners, deserving the full wrath and punishment of God. And our sin separates us from the very presence of God and eternal life. Paul put it this way in his letter to the Roman church, No, none is righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. And and there's nothing that we can do. There's nothing we can do, not one of our efforts that we even try, if we do, can please God. Paul put it this way in his letter to the Ephesian believers, you are dead in the trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1. And then in that very same letter to the Ephesians, we encounter two of the most Wonderful words that possibly could be found in the New Testament. But God. Two wonderful words that changed my life, and I pray they change your life. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 8. My friends, my brothers and sisters, whoever you are listening to this, wherever you are, this is good news indeed. Let us pray. Lord, um, I just want to pray for everyone who is hearing this, watching this, whatever way they are doing this. I ask God that you would help them to Uh, understand this message. That they would understand Psalm 119, verse 33 to 40. That my words would be just pushed to the side, that your word would do the work that it set out to do. And Father, I pray for those with with ears to hear and hearts to know the, the love of God that surpasses all things, all our understanding. And help us, Lord, as your children, as your people, as followers of Christ, to go out with our hands and feet and share the love of Christ with those we meet. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Shalom.